is going to focus on drop because that's the really the big issue these days. And I want to give some uh, historical and prehistorical perspective and talk about some of the factors that are affecting drought in this region. Give you an update on the current conditions and give you a little news as to uh, what might be in store. Um, so this is a plot that I made a couple years ago and I've been updating it that shows uh, the, the rainfall in summer and average across Texas uh, against the average summertime temperatures. And you can see that the, there's a bit of a negative slope there. The, the wetter it is, the cooler the summer tends to be. 2011 is that big dot in the uh, upper left that corresponds to um, extremely hot and dry conditions that we had during that particular year. And 2012 and 2013 were a bit more normal as far as rainfall goes, but they were still kind of on the dry side as far as uh, precipitation. Um, oh, I'm sorry, they're a little on the warm side as far as temperatures. Now, what this tells us basically is that natural variability has a big effect on our summertime conditions. They're really a, a serious problem to forecast because there's such a big range of conditions that can happen and we don't really have a really strong signal uh, that develops ahead of time that we can identify and uh, use for summertime forecasting. But the general upward drift in temperatures I think is associated with climate change. I just want to briefly indicate what that means. Um, that means that essentially in another maybe 50 years we can expect the, this envelope of points to have moved upward on this graph by about one or two degrees. So not necessarily less rain so much as uh, warmer temperatures. But the warmer temperatures as we've seen lead to more rapid evaporation and uh, ultimately drier conditions overall. So it's not really possible to look back at previous droughts and say that's what future droughts are going to look like. But at least we have a, a sense of how things are changing as far as the temperatures go. Rainfall is still strongly affected by natural variability uh, as you'll see. Okay, I want to get a little history of the drought based upon average rainfall across the state of Texas. Uh, going uh, starting in October where you normally have the ground starting to finally get moist again uh, the, the moisture accumulates in the soil through the winter months and then you get into the hotter time of the year and that's when we have net evaporation taking place. Normally the rainfall just adds up throughout the year uh, a little bit more fat quickly during May and June and also during September and October. It varies a bit, of course, across the state. In uh, the year 2009 to 2010, that was our last uh, above normal year. Uh, statewide came in about 20% uh, above normal. Um, those were the good times, I suppose. Then the 2010-2011 the drought came along, and we've got to basically about 40% of normal on average across the state which is, of course, uh, uh, way dry and much drier than any previous water year's precipitation that we've observed. And that drought has basically persisted since then. If we look at the following year, it was normal rainfall, but it was really kind of hard to tell based on conditions on the ground because there's been so much damage caused by uh, previous year's drought on the one hand, and secondly, because the uh, soils were so depleted of moisture that a lot of that normal rainfall just went into trying to make up ground that was lost from the previous year. And uh, last year was on the dry side again, especially during the first half of the year. And we had decent amounts of rain during the summer, but that's not really going to be good for adding moisture to the soil because that water tends to just turn right around and evaporate again. And then uh, finally, 
um, the, the first few years, for a few months of this water year, had started out pretty wet during the fall, but have turned to the dry side. We've had unusually dry winter. Uh, January, February combined came in somewhere around the, 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 the five driest January, Februarys on record. And uh, if that doesn't turn around very quickly, we'll end up with another dry year like we had last year. Um, you can see this year's precip really hasn't evolved like any of the previous years on this graph. Uh, going back in history, the closest analog I could find to how this is set up was uh, 1996, which was the, really the first drought in this drought sequence. Across the state, the past couple of months have been dry just about everywhere. Um, better off in northeast Texas, southeast Texas, as well as uh, deep south Texas. Um, this, by the way, is a product that we produce at the State Climate Office. It's available online. You can look at uh, rainfall compared to normal for a variety of time scales throughout the state. Uh, it's also been... Uh, least decent amounts of precipitation compared to normal in far west Texas, but this is normally the dry season, so that's not quite as big a deal. Meanwhile, you can see extreme dryness, which means uh, uh, it, it gets that dry maybe only about 5% of the time across uh, parts of central Texas and uh, up toward the Red River, as well as the eastern parts of the Panhandle. Now, I'll go back in time a bit and look at the past six months, which uh, highlights how dry it really has been along the Red River, uh, working uh, all the way across to the Panhandle. Um, meanwhile, uh, occasional pockets of, of wetness from either individual events or accumulation in South Texas and parts of Central Texas. Look at a monthly, at the annual time scale, not much different in the overall picture and uh, if you look past two years um, we're tapping into the long-term drought that we're in the middle of and you can see that uh, there are very few parts of the state that have actually had uh, abnormally wet conditions over the past two years on top of the first year of record drought so it's really been hard to recover this drought has been continuing um, at its best, there was only about 40% of the state of Texas in drought back in the fall, but that number has been going up again as things have turned dry. I want to highlight a few locations uh, around the state that showed the different conditions of rainfall during this drought. Uh, we've got five stations picked out, um, and I've numbered them on the drought on this map. You can see the first two and the fourth one are been on the dry side the past couple of years, the other two uh, have been on the wet side. So first, uh, Lake Kemp um, in the uh, Wichita Falls, Vernon area, and uh, their drought started out ridiculously dry. We're looking at uh, the green line is the actual rainfall, the brown line above it is what normal would look like. And so during the first year of the drought, Lake Kemp received about five and a half inches of rainfall, where uh, normal is about 26. And each year after that has been drier than normal also. So that over the past three years, what we see ultimately is uh, um, a difference of uh, about uh, 35 inches between what they would normally get in in three plus years and what they have received so they've missed more than a year's worth of rain over the past three years some of the situation over in the panhandle this is uh floyd data which uh um, had only about three inches of rain during the first year of the drought and again continued dryness so that over the past three years combined, uh, I've only received 34 inches of rainfall, which is uh, one year's normal rainfall for central Texas, and is less than half of uh, what they would normally receive over the same period. 
Now, in the, in the San Angelo area, the rainfall has been sort of keeping up with, uh, with, with normal over the past couple of years. This is Eden, Texas. But the rainfall has come in some rather large chunks, like uh, um, seven inches of, of rain back in the fall of 2012, and another eight inches of rain during uh, uh, July of uh, last summer. And uh, really, over the past uh, six months, it's turned dry again. Uh, it picked up uh, about three inches of rain in that period where normal would be about six or seven. So the dryness is spreading it into areas that had been reasonably wet. Another area I'll highlight as being dry is the uh, area between, uh, say, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, Victoria, that region. This is Runga, Texas. And um, you can see that really the first year's drought does not look an alarmingly worse than how dry it's been this past year. Uh, we're now running a deficit of uh, about 48 inches compared to normal over the past three years. So that's a lot of water that's not in the deep root zones in, in many parts of the state. The last station I want to mention um, is what uh, near normal rainfall looks like in Texas. Uh, Extended dry periods, interspersed with occasional floods. This is uh, Carrizo Springs, which is uh, out there, uh, basically between Laredo and uh, and the Edwards Plateau. And while they've gotten near normal rainfall, it's been in very short chunks and far enough apart that the ground has been able to dry out in between. So it really hasn't been. An adequate year for rainfall, even though the total seems to add up. Now, looking at the drought as a whole for the state, this is the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is a standard measure of drought. And the thick black line is the is the current drought, uh, which is now in its fourth year, and it's outlasted all but two of the previous historical droughts. Uh, the 19, drought in the early 1960s was not very severe, um, but of course the drought of the 1950s is the granddaddy, and uh, it uh, peaked out almost as intense as our first year of drought, but it's last, it lasted much longer than the current drought has. So right now I'd say this drought has surpassed all but the drought of the 1950s in terms of combined intensity and duration makes it the second worst drought on record. Now we can extend the record back a little bit farther um, by looking at uh, tree ring data, which uh, has been done in a study that looked at uh, cypress, uh, cypress trees in uh, sheltered areas, as well as the original settlers' homes built out of post oak, and that wood's been preserved. You can basically see what the tree rings look like in those in those buildings and line them up to get a history. And here I'm displaying things um, as a function of the duration of droughts. Let's just look at this one column here. Uh, for two-year droughts, the, the most severe drought um, was up here in 1715 and 1716, where the average Palmer Drought Severity Index was minus seven, which is ridiculously low. There were a couple other droughts in the late 1700s, then a drought in the 1600s, drought in 1805. I've only plotted the top five plus uh, the worst drought from the 20th century, but that was in the 50s and it actually ranks only 16th on this scale. So in terms of having two years in a row of very dry conditions, we really haven't seen anything like what's present in the tree ring data. Uh, if we go to three years, um, we come out uh, now ranking number 10 with the current drought, 2011 through 2013. And it's not really a whole lot worse from the second worst drought on record for over three years. But that really highlights that drought in the early 1700s. That would have been uh, an incredibly devastating drought. And it will be if such a drought happens again uh, um, in present-day situations. Um, 
the the 1950s drought lasted six years and indeed it was the driest six years on record for the Edwards Plateau region and driest six years according to the tree ring records also. The current drought, if you count all the way back to 2008, actually ranks number four on this list. So in terms of this extended period of dryness, we are approaching uh, historical conditions. Uh, we get the same basic pattern for South Central Texas. I won't dwell on the numbers except to say that uh, the present drought for South Central Texas is actually worse than the 1950s drought on uh, most of these time scales. But it still doesn't rival that drought in the early 1700s, which uh, dominates the, the picture. Okay, now we can learn something about the, the, the coming and going of droughts by uh, trying to find relationships between our weather and things happening in the rest of the climate, especially ocean temperatures. We know that there are long-term variations in ocean temperature both in the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, and in uh, Computer models, they turn out to influence Texas weather in particular. And in the historical record, they, they exhibit a strong influence on Texas record, Texas weather. So I've taken uh, long-term climate stations from each of these eight regions of Texas and combined the data. I've uh, smoothed it to eliminate the El Nino type variation and uh, plotted the precipitation as a fraction of the long-term average. So one means rainfall over that period exactly matched the long-term average. Zero would be no rainfall. Uh, two, if it were up here, would be twice the normal rainfall. So a change of 0.1 corresponds to a 10% change in rainfall. And what you see on a multi-decade scale is a whole lot of variability with rainfall from uh, December through March. Um, decades can, can be 30, 40% wetter or drier than the preceding decades. Um, we see the drought of the 1950s um, showing up as uh, this dip right in the middle. But on the whole, we see an increase from the early part of the 20th century all the way up to present day where the northern half of the state has actually uh, been running in the winter time 20-30% um, above the long-term average. Now we can compare this to what's happens in the Pacific Ocean and we find they're pretty closely related. I've tilted the graph for the Pacific so that it shows the same long-term increase that we've, we've got but you can see these curves match up pretty well. Where, where this value is high, so is the rainfall. Where this value is low, so is the rainfall. And so on. What this is a plot of is essentially the long-term version of El Nino in the Pacific. It's a very similar temperature pattern, except it comes and goes on a decade or multi-decade time scale. And what we see is it was... Uh, particularly negative and unfavorable to rainfall during the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. And mainly is having an effect on wintertime rainfall. And recent period is also on the negative side, and we have seen a decrease of rainfall recently, and as uh, most of the state has noticed. Uh, so that's the, that's the winter. If we look at spring and early summer, there's much less variation across the state. We can see changes on the order of only 10 to 20 percent. There's no long-term trend. Uh, the northern half of the state tends to behave differently from the southern half, but they both tend to be fairly flat. So there's no, without any strong signal, uh, there's no, nothing really to predict. For summertime, we again see a lot of variability. Uh, with drought in the 1950s and wetness more recently, plus a long-term upward trend. And now the thing I'm comparing it with is uh, an index that measures temperatures in the North Atlantic Ocean. 
And you can see a negative correlation here. Where the Atlantic Ocean is cold, we tended to be wet. When the Atlantic Ocean was warm, we tended to be dry. When it was cold, we tended to be wet. And now, recently, it's turned warm again. And uh, we're starting to see a drop off of rainfall, which, if I extended it to include the current drought, would be a bit more dramatic. Yeah. So, basic message here both the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean affect our climate, but in different seasons. Now, if you line them all up and shade in the periods of time when the Pacific would tend to produce a cool winter or dry winter, and the Atlantic would tend to produce a dry summer, we've got overlap in the 1950s when we had the drought of record, and we've got overlap right now uh, since about the year 2000, where we've again been seeing. Uh, several droughts and the current one is now looks like it's trying to rival drought of record in the 1950s so unfortunately not only does this explain the droughts it also says that they're they're going to continue either continuously or off and on until something changes in either the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean on a long-term basis and based on how long these periods lasted in the past we could be talking another 10 years or more of frequent drought like we've seen over the past 10 to 15 years. And that's on top of the rising temperatures. This is a plot of very smooth temperatures, again, over the past century in different regions of the state. And it basically shows that in the past couple decades, we've finally gotten above the historical temperatures that we saw in the middle part of the century. The coldest month of, coldest period of time for some reason was actually the 1970s and early 1980s. But we're now warmer than uh, historical conditions. Okay, now that's a bit of a long-term look. What's that, what that mean for the next year? Well, here's the official outlook for rainfall for May through July. I'm looking at it as uh, in a, a form which looks at the probability of being either above normal or below normal. And for most of the country, the Climate Prediction Center is not really forecasting anything special. But for the Gulf Coast, especially the western Gulf Coast, it's got enhanced chances of below normal rainfall for the springtime. Which is, uh, since it's been dry this winter, that's really the last chance of really uh, recharging things. Um, it's been, we've had sort of decent rainfall uh, off and on in southeast Texas in this corner, but as I highlighted, much of the rest of uh, south central Texas has been running very dry, so this is not a good sign going into the summer. And of course, temperatures, the basic message is above normal is most likely. Uh, here the uh, forecast is for 55 to 60 percent chance of being above normal. Of course, normal chances would be 50 percent. Now, that's a bit of pessimism. Let's uh, let's let's get a bit of optimism going. So, as I alluded to, the biggest driver of year-to-year -year variations of rainfall is El Nino and La Nina, and that's the temperature pattern in the tropical Pacific. Uh, here we've got a map of ocean temperatures in the tropical Pacific. And what you see is fairly common. We have this tongue of cold water along the equator going out from South America almost all the way to northern Australia, but you get some nice warm temperatures out here in the western tropical Pacific. Now with a La Nina, which is uh, conditions tend to be dry in Texas, you've got uh, amplified cold temperatures here. All of the thunderstorm activity in the tropics moves over to the warm water out here and that affects the the whole weather pattern around the globe if you change where the air is rising along the equator. With an El Nino, uh, the warm water extends eastward and so does the thunderstorm activity and there's the net effect of that for our weather tends to be a cool and wet winter. So this is the current pattern, and in fact, compared to normal, it's actually running below normal like it has for most of the past, <clears throat> excuse me, three years along the tropics. It's been either neutral or 
uh, La Nina or La Nina like conditions. In fact, here's a graph of different areas in the tropics over the past year. And blue indicates below normal temperatures, which has been the norm, unfortunately, for <coughs> excuse me, for the past uh, past year. Now things look like they might be changing. And the way we look at that is we look down below the surface of the ocean. This is a, a plot that's kind of interesting. It's showing um, the the temperatures. Well, the bottom, let's start at the bottom. It's showing temperatures beneath the surface of the ocean going down as much as 450 meters or, or 1500 feet and the warm temperatures of the tropics uh, 29 celsius is about 85 fahrenheit those nice warm temperatures are confined to the top uh, 100 150 meters or so of the ocean and you can see that as you go farther west you've got cold water from ben below being brought up to the surface uh, the basic reason that happens is because there are trade winds along the equator that blow from east to west, and so they're driving water along the equator from east to west, and cold water is rising up to replace it. Now, the thing that looks promising is that this warm water here is, is first off, unusually deep. Um, you can see that if you look, compare it to normal temperatures, temperatures are actually 5 to 6 degrees Celsius above normal along the base of that pool of warm water. And it turns out that that has gradually been working its way um, westward over time. If you look at uh, how deep that pool is and plot that as a function of time, um, the, what we see is a regular propagation. Okay, so what we've got here, this is the last really fancy graph I'm going to show you, uh, is uh, time going downward for the past year, and we're looking at the how, how deep that pool of warm water is. And from left to right, we're going from the east, from the west Pacific across to the east Pacific. So occasionally you get these pools of deep water developing, and they move eastward at a fairly steady pace. Here's one, here's another one, and then uh, an area that was unusually shallow moving along, and then a, a deep pool of warm water, then uh, shallow, and now a especially deep pool uh, moving moving westward. It, uh, the leading edge of it was back around the date line in January, and leading edges moved uh, uh, all the way to about 120 degrees west by, by the beginning of March. So the idea is that uh, as that warm water finally makes it over to the, to the west coast of the uh, Pacific Ocean, the, the cold water will be driven downward and will have warm temperatures at the surface of the ocean. And once that happens, hopefully the thunderstorms will start developing over that warm water, and that'll alter the wind fields, and the whole thing will basically reinforce itself, and we would get, if that worked out, what we call an El Nino. Now, the forecasts for El Nino from are somewhat mixed. Um, this, is, this is all the different forecast sources looking at... Uh, temperatures in the tropical Pacific. Anything above 0.5 would count as an El Nino if it lasts long enough. And you can see everything is tending toward warmer temperatures over the by the summer. JJA is June, July, August. Um, so it looks like we won't have to worry about La Nina anymore. So nothing's going to be driving our winter weather to be dry. But if an El Nino does develop, then we would have, uh, well, two years out of three with an El Nino, we get a wet winter. Um, in fact, the model that tends to do the best in forecasting is this one, and it's on the warm side. So I don't know if you caught the news, but this morning, uh, Climate Prediction Center officially issued an El Nino watch, uh, which means that uh, there's a better than 50% chance in their judgment that an El Nino is going to develop uh, in the next six months or so. So... Bottom line there is that we're about two steps removed from drought relief. <clears throat> First off, 
hopefully uh, the El Nino will develop. And then if it lasts through fall and early winter, then we have a, a, a better, probably better than two and three chance of having above normal rainfall this winter. So it's not written in stone. I mean, it's not guaranteed we'll get an El Nino, and it's not guaranteed that we'll be above normal rainfall even if we do get an El Nino. But up until now, just about everything uh, during this drought has been pointing toward the neutral or dry side for us. And finally, finally we have something going, which looks like it might be on the wet side. <clears throat> Actually, last year there were hopes that we might get a weak El Nino developing, um, but it turned out not to pan out. This time around, the, the, the temperature variations in the tropical Pacific are much stronger, and so forecasters are much more confident. And uh, I, at least, am much more hopeful. Uh, so, to summarize where we are right now, we're in, in the fourth year of this drought, which really ranks second worst in history. And we're in the middle of an unusually dry winter on top of the long-term drought. So, uh, there may be some serious issues with... Uh, uh, you know, lack of production of hay and so forth because of the um, lack of moisture in the ground right now. And a lot's really going to depend upon what we get uh, in, the, in the wet months of uh, April, May, and June. They could, uh, they could promote a recovery and get the summer pastures off to a good start. Or if it stays dry, we're going to have another hard time with this year. Uh, and... Once this drought's over, there'll probably be another drought somewhere not too far in the distant future because of the long-term patterns that, at least for this decade, are favoring drought in Texas. And uh, like I say, there's nothing through the summer that is looks like it'll turn things around. Weather is pretty random, so we don't need to have something uh, out there in an ocean before we can get an occasional heavy rainfall event. Uh, even though that hasn't happened in the past few years. But we do have something promising further off down the road. And uh, keep your fingers crossed that uh, perhaps we'll get an El Nino developing and we'll at least by about November or so is when it starts having a big impact on our weather. Um, it'll, it would tend to suppress hurricane activity during the summer, but then turn things wet again in the fall. So maybe down the road there is some good news. Um, at least it's, it's, it's better news than I've been able to give in a while. I'll be happy when it's actually uh, something certain rather than just a, a tilting of the odds in our favor. Anyhow, if there's something you think of after this seminar you don't have a chance to answer, ask during the Q&A, you can get a hold of me by, <clears throat> by email or by telephone. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, drought maps and a lot of other information we have available is on our uh, state climatologist website, which is climatetexas.tamu.edu. <laughs> so I encourage you to go there for, for uh, climate monitoring information and talk to me if you need anything specific. Um, and that's all I have for my presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Gammon. If you all have any questions, Y'all can type them in on the chat pod, and then Dr. Gavin will be glad to answer them. The chat pod being the one on the lower left-hand corner. C1 says, thanks for the webinar. Uh, Star County asked you a question. The uh, question is, how busy are topic, tropics going to be? The, um, the official forecast will not be coming out until the end of May. But if things stay on track for El Nino, that would tend to mean uh, less activity than normal in the tropics. Um, in the Atlantic, I assume we're talking about, would tend to be um, 
normal to below normal activity with a with an El Nino. <clears throat> the El Nino tends to increase the tropical wind shear. Conversely, though, in the uh, in the west in the west uh, in the west coast on the eastern Pacific, you tend to have more active, and that can potentially benefit uh, west and uh, north central Texas because sometimes you get moisture from a decaying storm that makes landfall in the Gulf of California, and then that moisture comes across and and produces some nice uh, September rainfalls for the interior of Texas. So even though hurricanes are being probably be suppressed with an El Nino in the Atlantic, that's not all bad news. If you're living on the coast, it might be good news. I see two more questions being typed. The question from Rachel is, could the drop be related to cutting down trees? Um, well, the, the, uh, the relationship between trees and drought are mediated partly through soil moisture and then partly through the atmospheric moisture. So trees tend to, tend to uh, provide a bit of a cooling influence because they're able to um, tap into deep moisture and enhance evaporation as a result of that. Now, evap the evaporation puts water into the air, which can then come down as precipitation. So the trees themselves um, won't be um, reducing the amount of precipitation. They can potentially uh, increase the amount of precipitation. On the other hand, at the same time, they're, they're, they're drawing moisture from the soil and uh, they, um, they're also intercepting water which uh, is otherwise not falling to the ground. So if you're trying to uh, get moisture for pastures, the trees are sort of taking away some of that moisture that would be available for pastures. So as a result of all of that, um, cutting down trees um, tends to leave more water available uh, in the ground, but it also uh, will causes um, can cause more runoff because the trees are act to sort of slow down the the, the rate at which the water um, encounters the ground so you get a little bit more runoff you lose water that way plus the trees through lack of shade mean that you have more evaporation from the top surface of the soil so lack of trees means you tend to have a drier soil surface but you have uh, more soil moisture deeper down, so um, it's sort of a sort of a trade-off. It's not that trees are necessarily good or necessarily bad to drought. They basically affect where the water is getting stored and, and how rapidly it's getting retrieved from the soil. Uh, yes, sir. Herbert asked a question. What is the effect of Atlantic temperature? On uh, the, the basic correlation we see that when the is when the Atlantic is warm. Uh, Summer rainfall in the central United States, including Texas, tends to be suppressed. And the reason for that is, it goes back to the thunderstorms again. Thunderstorms like to form where you've got the greatest instability, where you have the greatest amount of warmth and moisture. So if the Atlantic Ocean is extra warm, then that's where the thunderstorms are going to want to be. And that's where you'll get tropical storms forming also, which are just basically organized, concentrated thunderstorms. Uh, if the ocean is relatively cool, then the land can potentially heat up more than the ocean does, and you get more thunderstorm activity forming over land. So even though a warm Atlantic is great for hurricanes, it turns out to be bad for getting thunderstorms on the land surface. So uh, um, it's uh, sort of backwards from how you might expect it to be based on hurricanes, but actually we... For summer, we tend to want a cool Atlantic. Now, I've tried to use that for forecasting on a year-to-year -year basis. It really doesn't work. There's just, it's just too random, the year-to-year -year variations. The only time you really start to see the effect of the Atlantic Ocean temperatures is when you look at uh, five or ten years altogether and find out that it's averaged out to be higher or lower than you'd expect it to otherwise.
Uh, thank you. Uh, the Star County Extension Program asks, what caused extreme cold winter all across the country? Um, well, the, 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 the ultimate cause we really do not know. Um, the, the immediate cause is a change in the jet stream pattern. Normally, we have a strong jet stream in the Pacific and bringing storms into the west coast of the United States, and then the jet stream moves on eastward across the United States to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this year, the jet stream in the Pacific was weak and didn't really make it all the way to the west coast, and the Atlantic jet stream was strong, and it was drawing air southward from Canada and then carrying it across the Atlantic. And any time you got the upper levels drawing air southward from Canada, a lot of that air is going to make it all the way down to Texas. And so we had quite a few very cold uh, cold fronts um, where by, you know, normally there'd be this battle going on between air coming from the Pacific and air from the poles. The Pacific air didn't show up this year, and so we just got lots of uh, cold air from the, from the polar regions coming down. Um, like I say, the reason that pattern happened to set up this year, we don't know. There's some, there's some evidence that it might be related to the changes in the uh, amount of ice cover in the Arctic. And indeed, uh, the Arctic Ocean and the, the, that whole area of really high latitudes was unusually warm this year. As a general rule, if, if, if one place is ridiculously cold, someplace else is going to be ridiculously warm. And I happened to notice in the middle of February while we were going through one of our cold spells, Nome, Alaska, was was in the 50s and setting all kinds of records. So it's, uh, I don't know to what extent it's one of those things or whether there's a cause that says we might see that more in the future or not. It's really way too early to tell. Uh, yes, sir. Be, uh, Bill and Hilk, uh... I guess it makes comment or question says in the hill country, tree removal may increase. In yeah, that's true. The the trees are basically help to 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 slow down the and and redistribute the the water. So the the bare the ground is, uh, the more rapidly water is going to tend to run off and and you get erosion as a result of that. And uh, of course that that's enhanced even more when you have a a fire. Uh, we haven't had to worry about uh, wildfires a whole lot since the first year of this drought because there hasn't been that much fuel produced. We haven't had a really wet year to produce fuel. Um, fortunately, this year, it, we could have had a fire danger, but we haven't had any really strong, uh, heavy, high wind events that might have you know, caused power lines to go down and that sort of thing. So I think we've been a little lucky this year, but we might still see some fire danger this spring as the as the, the dry the dry line kicks up as we go into April and March and April. I see Doug is typing a question. The question is, please expound on glacial, glacial melt. And is it okay, on the so um, the, um, I think the, 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 the leading explanation that, that makes the most sense to me is how these might be related is when you've got an, an open Arctic Ocean in, say, September and October, there's a that's an extra moisture source for for storms that are developing during the fall and that can consequently produce more snow than normal across uh, northern parts of north america and across uh, asia and siberia and once you've got snow on the ground in a in a cold environment that snow is going to tend to be reflecting sunlight back out to space it's going to tend to keep things cold and uh, consequently permanently affect the temperature pattern until you get into the spring and the snow starts melting again. So the idea is that that in turn affects where storms are going to form because storms form where you've got a contrast in temperatures and the storms interact with the jet stream to control jet stream location. And so it's sort of a chain of, chain of uh, one 
one thing causing another thing which causes something else which uh, uh, seems to uh, at least over the past few years lead to bottom line of an enhanced uh, uh, stronger than normal jet stream across the Atlantic and uh, cool temperatures uh, especially in the Northeast but also extending across the central United States so since uh, since we started seeing significant melt in the Arctic Ocean since about 2007 uh, about about 75 percent of the time we've seen an unusually strong Atlantic jet and uh, a fairly cold winter in the central and eastern United States. Um, like I say, it's still a bit early to be able to say whether that's really a, a physical relationship or whether we've just been unlucky four years out of six. But that's, uh, that's where we think the connection might lie. Yes, sir. Monta asks, please explain. Okay, the dry line is basically just a boundary of air masses. We've got air coming up in the spring from the um, from the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, basically Mexican terrain forms a big wall several thousand feet high along the uh, just inland from the western coast of the Gulf of Mexico. So the the shallow moist air is limited in its horizontal extent. And so if it's moving northward, there's a there's a western boundary to it, even even as it, after it goes from Mexico into Texas. Meanwhile, in the high terrain of Mexico and the southwest U.S., you've got desert. They tend not to have much rainfall during the winter, and so you get some pretty high temperatures developing there and pretty low dew points, low moisture as well. So the dry line itself is a boundary between the uh, air that formed over the high desert southwest and the air that came from the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a bit of a temperature difference. There's a lot of moisture difference. And in terms of severe weather, the big difference is that the air from the Gulf of Mexico has enough uh, moisture in it to form a thunderstorm, whereas the air from the desert southwest doesn't. And so anytime a disturbance in upper levels comes in from the west, the first place thunderstorms are going to form is the first moist air that that disturbance encounters, and that's going to be along the dry line. And so that's why we look to the dry line as an as a, as a important weather feature during the springtime, because that's where the severe weather tends to initially develop. Any other questions for Dr. Gammon? Looks like there's no more questions. So uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, type them out. Uh, I just moved a slide. Again, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Gammon, for a great session today. And uh, Appreciate you being here today, and thank you all for attending. Our next webinar is going to be April the 3rd, 2014, Mesquite and How to Treat It. And Dr. Bob Lyons uh, will be uh, the speaker on an April uh, webinar. Then again, uh, well, now you can uh, two things. You can follow us on Facebook. Uh, we have a fan page on Facebook where we announce webinars, and we put in some uh, educational, vi educational videos on there. So you see the, the Facebook page is... Uh, Facebook.com slash TX range. So go ahead and like us there. We appreciate it. And the next thing I'm going to ask is uh, 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 here in a little bit, you'll get a, you should be getting a, a, a little uh, audio, a little web uh, uh, survey. If you don't mind, it should be popping up on your screen. Uh, go ahead and answer it. Thank you all, Dr. Gammon. Thank you. Uh, it seems like uh, we have a bunch of thank you, thank yous, and uh, I don't see any more questions. <laughs>